All right, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to another program with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. This is nearing the end of our second big week back with broadcast in 2023, so a huge thank you to all you teachers for continuing to join us as we showcase and celebrate such amazing scientists and explorers from around the globe. We've already been to the Philippines, Antarctica, South Africa, Costa Rica, India. Uh, we've got even more programs coming up later today and some new locations all around the world. It has been such an incredible start to 2023 after over 500 broadcasts broadcast together last year. So thank you all so much. And I'm so excited to dive in with today's first program and a really interesting topic and speaker. So we are joined live at Toronto Metropolitan University by Brian Cavisto. He is a cutting edge researcher in solar technology whose work has taken him to all sorts of different areas of how we can harness the energy of the sun and energy from the world in a better and more efficient way. But beyond that, in the way that I know him is that he has been the literally like the personal mentor to half of the great science communicators in Canada. So uh, I owe my profession and like half the people in the field that I get to work with to Brian's tireless efforts to make sure that we get science out into the public eye. We excite people and engage people in this magical and wonderful world uh, and work to understand the world and universe around us. So a big thank you to Brian. I'm so excited to learn from him today, specifically on that solar technology. And without further ado, Brian, thank you so much for joining us in the program today. Jesse, thank you for having me. And that was some really good toe tap and music. I might be spinning in my chair the entire time. So uh. <laughs> it's a good time. We get people dancing at their desks every day. Uh. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yeah, you're well, all set, man. Presentations up. Let's do this thing. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Um, welcome. Um, I understand there might even be a, a group from Mexico, so Buenos Dias. Um, this is a, a little talk about sort of my journey into um, solar energy and what got me here and. Also talking a little bit about research and research culture so people understand what it takes and what people do um, to make technologies. And so the technology we're focusing in are solar cells and trying to collect the sun's rays. All right. So I want to first acknowledge sort of where I'm from and where I grew up so that people sort of know sort of the, the landscape and what sort of inspired me in this journey that now brings me as a, as a chemist. So uh, that's the, the field that I study. So I am right here this i don't know if you can see this circle that just emerged in, in the bottom uh right hand corner but that's where i'm seated at right now in uh, mississauga territory of indigenous uh, first nations but i didn't grow up in toronto i actually grew up in a rural area right in the heart of the the great lakes so between superior and lake huron in a not even in a county it's called a district up there so it was algoma district um and i'm going to come back to that because it really did sort of shape who i am uh, but I also, since we're talking about sustainability, I think it's really important that we start to think about sustainability and, and maybe the people who lived here sustainably before um, people from Europe arrived. And so uh, in this area, both the, the areas that I either are from or where I'm talking to you from today are that of the Anishinaabe people. So just to give a little perspective, because I, I it was my understanding there was going to be people from uh, Newfoundland here to give you a distance um, would be from like Deer Lake, which I think is is where Jesse's seated right now, to St. John's is roughly the distance between these little two stars um, that that have connected me and my journey. Of course, my journey didn't just go between those two places, and I'll get to that in a second. But for anybody who really wants to learn more, and I recommend this for teachers or or, or young people, there's a really excellent book that squares and and connects indigenous knowledges to Western sciences and shows that they're, 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 they're the same. They have a massive similarities, but the way that the information gets communicated is different. And that makes sense. And all levels of communication are very much appreciated in science. Um, they haven't always been, but that's where we are going. Okay, so I grew up on a farm. So I, I, uh, none of my uh, parents had done any university education. Uh, I, they stopped at high school, uh, loved it. It was a, it was a great uh, journey for me. And that's not, a lot of people won't be able to resonate with rural life or agricultural life. And, and that's fine. That, that's understandable because it is very different. And so many of us live in urban communities now, but you'll see that that has shaped me quite a bit in my journey towards science. So I was always one of those kids who was super curious. Like I was probing the environment. I was checking things out. I was watching like a toad or a frog for, for at, not hours, but a long time until, you know, it was raining so hard that mom had to call me inside the house, but always really curious, always asking why, wondering why. 
And that really sort of shaped uh, a lot of my journey as well. Of course, being somebody who grew up in the rural area, I also was fascinated by plants. And this is where I think really my journey with uh, how light interacts with things really started. So you got these beautiful colors, the greens, the reds, the purples, the oranges, the things that you were really drawn to, right? A lot of natural beauty. And I think I always wondered like, how did, how does that work? Like, how does, how does the sunlight cause that to grow? And that was always a question that I always was asking myself as a young person. Of course, we now understand that um, quite, quite well. And you'll see when we get to talk about that a little bit later on. And I love to cook. So that was the thing that I always loved to do. Even from a little kid, I was helping to bake or I was helping um, mom in the kitchen or dad when he was making his, his bread or things like that. And that's really chemistry, right? You're cooking, you're taking ingredients, you're mixing them together to make a new and innovative product. Now, you can't eat your chemistry experiments, but you can eat the food that you prepare. I mean, it has lots of the same sort of um, inspirations. Now, as a kid growing up, maybe people don't like playing with Lego, but I loved Lego. Everything that I saw in the world, um, I could imagine as a Lego or pieces of, of Lego building blocks. And then when I did get old enough in school and I saw chemistry for the first time and everyone has seen these volcanoes in the science fair experiments, or if you ever get a chance to watch Bill Nye or any of the real science communicators, the big ones, you'll see lots of colorful displays, but it looks like magic. Of course, chemistry is not magic, but it sure looks like it. And it could be explained as magic as well, too. So just completely fascinated and excited. And that really drew, took me down uh, on the path that I guess I'm still on. Um, of course, vision is another cool feature. Like, how do we see such remarkable colors? And so how do our eyes allow us to see these colors? And then there's other things in nature, like lightning and the massive amount of energy that you can see in the, in the night sky. Um, and the, here's a picture of downtown Toronto with a CN Tower getting struck by lightning. And among all of this, and coming back to my agricultural sort of upbringing, was this concept of sustainability. Um, it's going to be a big question for everyone's life. How do we make the world more sustainable? How are we able to exist in such a planet where we can balance economy and people and their needs as well as um, the environment itself? So all of these things took me down a journey towards chemistry because chemistry is a is one of those sciences that that can offer a lot of solutions to these challenges. So I need to before we get too far down the road, we have to we have to have some common language um, that we all understand. And I know that this is a mixed wide variety of, of folks in this audience audience. And I'm going to use well, probably too many big words, but I'm going to try to simplify them as best I can. And so the first one is a photon. Okay, so I want everyone to hopefully leave this today with what is a photon? And it's hard to imagine a massless particle, like something that doesn't have a mass, but we're calling it a, like a particle or like a, you could imagine like a marble or something similar. But anyway, when you are in the sun, you are constantly being exposed to these particles and they have energy. So that's why on a cold day, when you, you know you, you face the sun, you can feel the warmth on your face because that energy is being absorbed by your skin. So your skin is absorbing photons. The other thing, um, well, maybe there's two words here, is the atom. So the atom is comprised of, well, all matter, everything that exists that you see in front of you or the fact that you're even seeing is because we are made up of atoms. But more importantly, in these atoms, I think they're really important, are electrons. So the electrons are what I'm gonna focus on. You're not gonna hear me talk too much about atoms, but the periodic table, shows you all of the different atoms that exist in in our known nature as well as some of the man-made or the human-made ones but we're just going to focus on the electron because that is the glue that keeps all the atoms together and makes all the bonds in your body or anywhere when you look at materials around the room or presumably you're looking at a screen right now and it is electrons that are emitting photons and that is why you are seeing any color coming from that screen right now and then the last thing, because I'm a chemist, and if you you can't have a chemistry talk unless you use the word molecule, I remember I would always my dad who wasn't who didn't have a, a, a he, he finished high school background and he he would always ask oh so how's school like what are you doing how are things going and then I I wouldn't choose my words carefully and I would say molecule and you could just see his eyes glaze over so hopefully yours are not um, but a molecule is a specific arrangement of these atoms and electrons 
And I'm interested in what we call organic molecules. So they're ones that just use carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, or oxygen, or, or sulfur in some cases. And these are the ones that we see in nature. And they're, they were, they're the building blocks of everything. And then you have dyes, which is just another word for an, a colored organic molecule. So I'm wearing blue jeans today. I don't know if anybody else is wearing blue jeans today, but the blue in blue jeans is from this molecule in the bottom right-hand side of your screen called indigo. And indigo, just different amounts of it, will cause different colors of blue in your fabrics. So it's likely that if you see anything colored in your vicinity, then that is a dye that is creating that color. And a dye is just a molecule. So photons, electrons, and molecules are some of the language that I'm going to use today because I don't think I could explain this topic without it. Okay, so there is chemistry all over the world. I guess I've kind of hinted at that a few times. I'm a little bit biased, as you can imagine, because I am a chemist. Now, when you go and do research, the world is a very small place, and that's really the design of it. So what I'm going to express to you to, in this journey about research and trying to make discoveries, it takes you all over the world, and it's like a big family. Everyone does things in a very similar way, and you get to collaborate and work. And every time you see them in the future, it feels like you're meeting an old family member. So for a bigger perspective of just sort of the journey, as I said earlier, I was born in Sault Ste. Marie, which is a border town with the United States, 1976. So you now all know my age now. I'm 46 going on 47. Now, I went to my undergrad at this university, the University of Waterloo. So an undergraduate degree is something you do after high school. Um, and I think... Well, I, I would encourage everybody to, to try to pursue an undergrad because you learn so much more about the world around you and what it has to offer. Now, there are degrees beyond your undergraduate degree. So then I traveled to the west coast of Canada and I went to Victoria, which is a beautiful Canadian port city uh, north of Seattle in the United States um, on an island, um, Vancouver Island. And a PhD is a degree now where you become what they call a doctor. So that's why I'm allowed to use the prefix doctor in front of my name. A PhD means doctor of, of philosophy. So you're actually somebody who's, I guess, a, a bit of a philosopher, but that's what it's called for everybody. But then your learning still doesn't stop there. <laughs> and so you get, I went then to Edinburgh, Scotland for a couple of years, and then Calgary, where we've got close to the Rocky Mountains and the beautiful skiing that you could do. Just amazing, amazing views and great hiking and, and great life. And I say this because this journey is really important because it's, it seems long, but it doesn't feel long. It didn't feel long while I was doing it. And it didn't feel long. Now it feels like a long time ago. Now I'm trying to tell the story, I guess. But it is a journey that is worth every step that you take. And now I've been at Toronto Metropolitan University since 2011. So just over a decade. And this is where our research has taken off. And I'm really just going to talk about our research in the last 10 years. Now, the first thing I want to say is that you're always surrounded by mentors and people who inspire you and people who help you get better. And it's, it's like that favorite high school teacher that you have, but you see them for a much longer period of your life. And then you see them again at conferences or, or, or when you travel. And it's just, again, this is like your extended family. Although these people aren't related to me in any way, it just feels like they're my family. But they've also taught me so much about molecules. And so what you see all over the screen are just some unusual molecules that, that inspire other things. And just like cooking in a kitchen, as I said earlier, you make these things from their elements, essentially, or smaller building blocks. And then you can look at their properties. So as a chemist, I'm somebody who likes to make things that have never been made before in nature and then study their properties for an application. And the application here is photovoltaics. Okay, so you've seen solar panels, hopefully everybody has, um, they're everywhere. Why do we need to in innovate? Why do we need to improve these solar panels? Well, there's lots of good things, lots of pros. They've been around since the 1950s, actually, if you can believe it or not, that's when they were first invented. Um, but it's only now that we're starting to appreciate why we need even more of them and what we're going to use them for. It's a great, it's great technology, very mature. But it's also, if you've ever seen one, it's you can't see through it. So they have very limited design possibilities. They really can just be put out in fields. 
they can't be used in, in large urban centers because we don't have enough rooftops. So what is the technology we work on? It's called a next generation uh, photovoltaic or it's called a dye sensitized solar cell. So this animation in the top right hand corner is a solar cell. And I'll show you how it's constructed. It's constructed. You can hopefully see there's a little black dot and that's like showing you that you're looking right through the entire solar cell and it's optically transparent. So that means you can see right through it um, even though it's colored. And it's a sandwich. Um, it's a glass sandwich. And so the first thing is we have a piece of glass and we have a semiconductor, which I won't explain what that is, but it gets soaked in a solution. Just like if you were staining a fabric or dyeing something, you dip it in and it absorbs onto the semiconductor. And then you, you close your sandwich by adding that top layer. And then you fill it with whatever that secret sauce that you want to use to make it work. And that is a solar cell. And now it's an optically transparent solar cell. It's not very big because we only make prototypes in our lab, but it allows us to test our molecules because the molecules are the orange color in these solar cells. So the orange is because the molecule is orange. And so we get to test our molecules to see if they will actually work better at absorbing the sun's energy. And so you can see a whole bunch of different design possibilities, and that's why we're looking at these new technologies. You can see a window on the left-hand side um, and the parking lot, the cars in the background. So it's, you can see that was the optical transparency. But of course, it can be made into ribbons and polymers and plastics and coating. There's all sorts of design possibilities where now you could coach your entire outside of your house or your apartment or your townhouse or your, wherever you live with solar cells, as long as they were low cost. Um, and effective. The other thing is um, they work really well in diffuse light, which means the cloudy days. So let me first tell you how they work. So we have a dye molecule and that's the labeled as dye in this little picture. And then when the sun hits the, the, the solar cell, the molecule absorbs the photon and it's like pumping water uphill. So what happens is an electron goes higher in energy and that gives it the entire energy. So just the idea of if you put water into a water tower, the water tower then distributes the water and equalizes the pressure because it's higher energy, that water. So the same idea with this device, the electron then goes through the cell. It's now at its highest energy. It goes right through the other side where it produces what we call an electrical current because the electron's moving and then it's shuttled back to the die where it can regenerate and the whole process can happen again. And it's not just one dye molecule, it's billions upon billions of dye molecules doing this simultaneously. And so that's what produces an effective current. And that's why these little devices can produce electricity while being in the sun. And hopefully you're sitting in front of a screen. This is the exact opposite process that happens in your televisions, your OLED televisions or your computer screens that you're using right now, mine's quite bright. This is the reverse process where electrons go down in energy and emit photons. So it's the exact opposite process. Um, and so you can, you can compare and contrast a lot of these as similarities. Okay, so what's the challenge? Well, I sort of alluded to it earlier, of course, solar cells don't work well at night. That's not a challenge that I can, we can really address because there's not no sun at night. But they also don't, the current technology doesn't work very well on cloudy days. Now, if you're trying to make something that grows or works using light in a cloudy day, well, that's where you get to use your scientific method and get to be curious. And that's where you get to come up with what's called a hypothesis or an idea or something you want to test. And then you can go around using the scientific method to test your idea. But first you need inspiration. And I love this quote from Aristotle, in all things of nature, there is something of the marvelous. Nature does nothing in vain. And so nature with its green leaves is, and it doesn't matter if the sun's shining or not, the plants are still growing. They're able to work very effectively in both diffuse light and direct sunlight. In fact, some plants, as you know, die in direct sunlight, and that's why they have to be kept in the shade. And in the plant is something called the chloroplast. And the chloroplast has all of the green pigments in the plant. And between the lumen and the stroma in these thiacoid stacks right there is where all the cool machinery of nature happens. And I won't get too much into this, except to say 
there's molecules. It's molecules that do all of the work. Chlorophyll is a molecule. And then it's surrounded by other molecules that help it. And this is where, you know, we, plants produce oxygen and all sorts of really interesting processes. And it's called photosystem too. And, and that's a specific part of the plant growth cycle. So like I said, I love Lego. So when I think of molecules, I think of Lego because they're just little building blocks. And so when I go to the lab to make a molecule, I try to make it from little building blocks that we already have available to us. So you can imagine if I had these building blocks, hopefully you could see that I could convert these building blocks maybe into a house. So that's one possibility. But what if I had more blue blocks? I could make a completely different design that is even bigger, but still is made up of the same components. So hopefully that looks like a boat. <laughs> it's not a very good boat, but this is Lego and also working on a computer screen. So you gotta give me a little bit of credit here. But this little sailboat shows that what you can do with the same building blocks to make different designs. And so I can't explain necessarily um, how this all works, but these are the kind of molecules that you see on the right that our group has designed, that we like to use, that are actually our own personal design that mimic how photosynthesis and those green plants grow. And that is something that we're quite proud of, but it took us a long time to get there. And it's not an easy task to do overnight, but it works very well. That's the orange dye that you saw on those devices earlier. And it's something that we can build from and explore in greater detail. So future work as the, we just came off of the FIFA World Cup. So one thing I'd like to say is that, you know, in 2026, Toronto will be one of the host cities. Um, I, of course, it's hosted by Canada and Mexico. So if you get a chance to visit, we can talk more about our solar cells then. So there's an open invitation to come to Toronto. Um, Toronto is a massive, large city, like most uh, North American uh, cities. And you can see from the picture, it's just lots of glass windows. So what if we could replace or, or convert these existing glass windows into solar cells? Now, we wouldn't just be losing the energy from the window but we could actually build off of these existing structures. And that's why this is the direction that we're going in with coatings and films, because that would be better than having to replace a window. So if you could just change a window, that would be the best. Now, long-term stability is what we're always focusing on because that is a challenge when you work with molecules, because like nature, it's meant to be broken down and recycled. But that's also a good thing because that means from sustainability purposes, we'll be sustainable over a longer period of time. Now, finally, during COVID, when we were all remote, I reconnected with where I grew up. And you can see I made a little log cabin in the woods. It's very remote. Um, and the solar panels are on top of that, that roof. And the, on the gray shed, which is not man-made, but it was built there, is actually where we have our own photovoltaic testing lab so that we can test the solar cells in real world conditions, because that's going to be really important. So this is a little project that lets me connect with nature because as I said earlier, I love nature. But there are some challenges, especially in Canada. And that is, this was taken at the beginning of the month. And those are my snowshoe tracks. And you can't see those solar panels because they're covered in almost a foot of snow. So that is also another challenge when you think about designing new materials for nature or real world applications, is you'll have to think about a way to get that snow off the roof, which is not really, a chemistry problem so much as it is a mechanical problem. But with that, I just want to wrap up because one of the things I said about research when I was somebody traveling the world as I was continuing to learn from experts, now the reverse of these roles has happened and I get to be the expert. So I'm not the one that does most of the chemistry in the lab. It's this team of people. And this team of people, if you're an undergraduate student, you might be around for a couple of years. That's why you see similar people in different photos. If you're a master student, you might be around for three or four years or three years at max, sorry. And if you're a PhD, you might be around for four years. But it's like we get to have a more extended family. And now it's my turn to train these folks. And then they get to innovate with me. And I think this is probably the best part of my job is the family, the extended family that you get to create through science um, and lets you really enjoy um, the scientific method because it's not just 
the science, it's the people you're doing the science with and for. So with that, um, and of course the funding organizations because they support a lot of what we do. Uh, with that, I just wanna, I guess that's my time. And I wanna just, uh, I'm happy to guess to answer any questions uh, and thank you for your time. Fantastic, thank you so, so much, Brian. And may I say that the 2016 guy with the bow tie, the cool shirt and the hair was the coolest looking person you've ever had in your lab of all time. I don't know if they've gone on to equally look that cool, but- it was Yes, a... they just got their PhD from York. Hey, Actually, how about we, that? we have we have we have pictures of everybody wearing a bow tie, but I didn't get that one in because it's too long. So it was a it was a good good picture. Yeah. Next time, uh, if you want to come out of screen share, as long as you can see me, okay. we can have a bit of a conversation. Let me with just. Um, yeah, YouTubers, if you guys want to share questions in the chat, please do as well. But I'm going to harp on this idea of, of being a mentor and collaborating with so many people because it's something that we love to hear from scientists, no matter what their discipline around the globe. So you've had the chance to, again, work with so many students, but in your role, do you get to collaborate with scientists outside of Canada and other countries? And what does that process actually look like? Yeah, so that that is a really important aspect of, of, um, of science. And people forget that. I mean, at some level, um, it looks adversarial because you are trying to do the same thing or trying to complete the same goals, but it's not. Um, there's just massive amounts of collaboration. We saw it with COVID, right? That the reason we were able to develop vaccines for the, the for the for COVID so quickly was because every single research lab in the world was working on the same problem and contributing to that answer in some way. And when you have that many people working together, you can solve problems um, and fast, right? And the, but and so yeah. It, you know, just before COVID, I was back in Edinburgh and we were having a bit of a reunion. And so it's one of those weird things that it really did that that hurt a lot of the, the momentum beyond that because you, you didn't get to connect with those people as, as frequently anymore. So. So, yeah, it's something that uh, that is really important. It's critical uh, because we all inspire each other. And, that, and that's the key thing. I'm uh, again, I always love highlighting that story, but particularly the idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, Brian. Um, we had a class that got snowed out. You guys had this epic storm in Ontario the other day. Yeah. So their, their buses were all canceled, but they wanted to write in some questions. So I got one online and it's uh, solar energy becoming cheaper over time. Uh, this is something that, I mean, I've seen in my lifetime in a big way where it started out being catastrophically expensive, only available to elite institutions, universities, and what have you. How fast has that transition happened? And are we still getting cheaper and cheaper with solar technology over the last few years? Yes, so it's it's peaked. I, I, not peaked. It's sort of plateaued a little bit um, because there are limits to the technology. So uh, it, the, the the popular one, or the one that, that we've seen get so cheap, is it's the silicon based yeah. solar cells, and that's what the the pictures I showed. Um, there, because there's so much, there's a lot of energy that goes into making them, and people don't realize that. In fact, the solar cell has to run for five years before it starts to collect the energy that was taken to make it in the first place. Interesting. So so there's a big energy intensity and that energy intensity is effectively what you're paying for when you buy your solar panel. So that's why it's uh, it's plateaued and it's sort of stopped decrease in price right now because there just isn't there. You can't go much lower. Right. Uh, but yeah, it's in within reason. It's, it, it has come down and uh, and that's great because now it's accessible for more people. Fantastic. Uh, Mr. Hancock, we're going to head to Georgetown. If you guys have a question for us, come on in and take us Definitely. Uh, going off the idea of the, the cost effectiveness of solar panels, uh, what is like the efficiency? How much solar energy is collected? Is it 100% of the solar energy? Is it 10%? Yeah, it's never 100%. So on those, silic <laughs> on those silicon cells, the ones you put on your roof, it's 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 20%. But that's they also say at high noon. So that's when the light is directly like shining straight down on that solar cell. Um, it's around 20%. Uh, that's the the rating. Um, again, that angle, like say angle of instance. So the how the where the energy is pointing to makes a big difference. So the solar cells that um, that the new ones, the ones I talked about, the next generation ones, actually will still work with equal efficiency, even in diffuse light. So you don't have to move them around, um, and they will even get light from the inside of your house at night that escapes. But it's still only going to be around 10% efficient in those in those sort of circumstances. Uh, but still, that's light right now that's currently just being lost. That's energy that's not being used. So anything in terms of our mitigation strategy it would, would be beneficial. Do you know offhand what the comparison is versus something like coal or oil? Like what percentage of energy we're getting out of those? Like a solar comparable? Is it better or worse? What have you? Yeah, so combustion is uh, because you can't trap 
the heat and those cogens, they're they're rough. They're roughly about you're taking mass, but you're you're going to make CO two as a product. But there you can convert with the I think it's called the Carnot cycle. You can convert up to thirty five percent of it usually as the heat into electricity um, when you burn something. Uh, but it's not really a great way because chemical conversions are always more efficient. They're at, they maximize at, at around seventy percent if you could. Uh, but yeah, I don't think like th when you store things in like these lithium ion batteries, everyone's got a cell phone. That's the battery that that's in your phone. Um, it can it can store energy pretty efficiently and to convert it pretty efficiently too. So um, in terms of the efficiency, it really depends on what you're using. But at least there are no emissions. Well, and speaking of efficiency, we have one of our uh, again email messages from our <laughs> snowed in classes uh, about the best place. You highlighted this great slide of, of solar panels covered in snow, and that's one of the our Canadian northern problems. Is there a place in the world where it's the most efficient? Is it near the equator? Are there certain countries that get more solar input or, or less bad weather than others? Like, is there a peak place? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, deserts would make a lot of sense, right? Because they have a lot of light. Um, uh, but they, nobody lives there, so that it wouldn't be useful to generate energy there. But yes, the equator is the best spot because you know throughout the year you get twelve-hour days. Ideally, you wouldn't have um, too close to large bodies of water where you get a lot of cloud, um, because so that's why California particularly comes to mind because they don't have a lot. They they but then they have forest fires, <laughs> so yeah, I, like you wouldn't want to have solar cells in that environment either. So yeah, you I think it's. Where all over the world they'll make a difference and have an impact, but it really, yes, there's going to be better places where you get more sun throughout the year. Uh, we've got a question from Rebecca. She's joining us in New York. Uh, how far out from are your technologies from production? When when can this? When when will we see this in our schools and houses? So there is a company in Germany using very similar technology right now, and they actually have a production line. Um, mm. So and now it's just about making improvements uh, to those technologies. So they roll them out as polymers. Uh, the company's name is Heliotech. Um, now they're they can make them. I don't know if they've got like a what they have in terms of market yet in terms of like how what they're selling them them for. But it's like it's almost it's produced using polymers and plastics, and so you actually. In these situations, you're actually using um, it's like roll to roll, almost like you're buying yards of fabric. So you're buying yards of this stuff, right, to coat coating. So it's still primarily for industrial applications because you know the cost might be a little bit high right now. But it's these things are coming out um, already. Yeah, I just pulled up the website for this. It's the swankiest website I've ever seen in my life for Heliotech. So if you want to check yeah. it out, I'll put that in the chat for people too. But uh, really, it's such an exciting time to be interested in this. And to, uh, I mean, there's so much going on that's sort of negative when it comes to conservation and energy challenges and things that we hear in the news all the time. But it's also, there's so much innovation happening all around the globe. And there's we're right on the cusp of so many great things that it's, it's I don't know, I find it very exciting. I don't know where your headspace is at for. Yeah, you know, and I think. Well, actually, you know, I yes, it's really important. I, I actually, I, I could be philosophical about this, and I, I don't think I should. Because, but I, but there is, so right now it's kind of urgent too, right? Because we're moving towards this electric vehicle push. So they're going to see a lot more electric vehicles. But people, I don't think, realize how much energy an electric vehicle takes, right? <laughs> to power it. It's while an electric vehicle is running, it is essentially the same amount of energy that your house needs when it's running. So it is a lot of energy. So for every car that you're you're needing to power, your where does that energy come from? And so it you know it, there's very few jurisdictions that produce that much excess energy. So we're going to need to find new ways to generate electricity just to move those other green envelopes and those other green technologies forward. Uh, so I think it's it's that's probably why why you're seeing so much innovation in this space right now because it's urgent. Yeah, I. Uh... It, it's something that we hear from our students all the time. We get the chance to talk about climate uh, as sort of a regular part of our broadcasting. So it is. It's it's unnerving but exciting at the same time. A bit of both. And I, I'm glad you did go a little philosophical with us there for a minute. Um, I'm going to head back to Mr. Hancock Live, our, our class that made it in today. Uh, if you guys want to come back in for a second question, you're good to go. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, getting philosophical and talking about the future and our goals. Um, what are the, some of the ramifications for solar energy and space travel? I know I've heard some good things about solar sails. Yeah. yeah. So you so solar energy is already what powers everything in space, and they actually use um, so they use solar technology that is so expensive that they they would only use it in space, right? So they use they so there's a 
there's one solar cell made from gallium and arsenide, so gallium arsenide, and it's the most efficient one, but it's only used in space <laughs> because it's so expensive on this planet. Um, but of course, the nice thing about space is that you know our our ozone layer protects us from a lot of the sun's radiation, especially the harmful stuff for our human tissues. But in space, there's a lot more uh, energy because there is no, it's just the vacuum of space, and so there's a lot more light. And so all of those technologies that you see leave our so or our uh, planet are all powered by solar cells. So mm. where it's going to go in the future, um, the solar sails, like the winds, it's pretty windy out there too. So maybe you would literally be you would be sailing, uh, but it, it would be. I, I don't know if how they're going to be thinking about when they move to Mars. I don't know that. I think we should worry about this planet before we start thinking about colonizing another, another one. <laughs> might, might be a good plan. Yeah. I have put the, a solar sailing link for Planetary Society in the chat for everyone. So Bill Nye, who you mentioned, is one of the sort of world's biggest proponents of this and, and the test case uh, first solar sailing happened not too, too long ago in the lifetime of our kids. So uh, if you are curious, do check that out. Uh, Klaus online wanted to know, are we close to replicating plants? You highlighted this photosynthetic uh, uh, capacity. And again, you know, plants create energy out of the sun all the time. Are we ever going to get there? Are we close? Are people miles off? What's the deal? Yeah. So that, that's a great question. Um, so plants, so, okay. If, so as a chemist, you know, it, I sort of showed you those molecules and they were all arranged and it, I, I oversimplified everything, um, deliberately, but so to, to replicate a plant would be very, very hard to do because biology has had billions and billillions of years to, 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 to in evolution to come up with this design. And this design has been perfected for this ecosystem and this planet. Um, and you know the nice thing about plants is they can they can lose their leaves and then the next year they in the springtime, their leaves come out again. That's going to be a really hard hard thing to do. But biomimicry, so not copying, but sort of being inspired by nature is really, I think, an area that everyone is super excited about. Because as we learn more about plants, as like how they communicate through their root systems, like like plants and trees talk. They don't talk in the same language that we do, but they talk. And so their roots and, and the mycelia of fungus that connect them all, like there's a lot going on. It's not, and it's not like Avatar, like don't get me wrong. It's not, it's not, I don't think it's that colorful, but there's there's intimate communication below the, the 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 forest floor and we're just starting to know how that works and like even when there's a disease in a forest and it's propagating through plants can build defenses based on the communication from other plants so that like it's it's learning mm -hmm. that there is a threat now that's that to me is that's that's intelligence, a different level of intelligence, and that's not going to be easy to to replicate. But we can mimic it. We can learn from it, and then we can build a simpler model. So our actual the solar cell, the disensitized solar cell, is literally a, a biomimic of that photosystem, doing almost the exact same things. But it, but it's not going to ever grow like a plant. But one more thing, if you could find ways, plants can heal too. That's the other cool thing. Like humans can heal too when we get cut. If you could find a way to replicate that, your solar cell would live on forever. It would never die. It would never break down, right? That would be cool too. So I, I'm super, I, the more I learn about plants, the, the more I get excited about this because there's so much that we could learn um, and we're just on that tip of the iceberg. I'm rapidly making little banners here to highlight the thing. So a, a fantastic book for any students that are interested on uh, sort of the science behind how trees connect with one another. Finding the Mother Tree, Suzanne Samard is an amazing researcher at UBC in Vancouver. I uh, really encourage you to check that out. And Green Planet by BBC. So I grew up with nature history documentaries and they've sort of redone one of their very famous ones on the world of plants. And again, it, it's, you know, we're here talking about solar technology and we dive in with how incredible biology is. And this is something that, you know, is a big part of your work is linking chemistry, biology, doing something where you end up with technologies from it. But it's quite astonishing to think about the molecular mechanics when you get down to plants and fungi and how they communicate. We, we could, as you can see, my face hurts from smiling. It's a very exciting <laughs> Um Brian, time flies and you're having fun. We got time for a few more quick questions. Uh, so Rebecca wanted to know again here, I'll bring it up in the thing. Public awareness campaign for floating solar array being built in town. Some key points to highlight to gain public support and awareness. You are going to hopefully hear with your insights, help a town get some cool solar array stuff going on. Or maybe not. We'll find out. 
What do you think? And so yeah, so how would you build? Okay, so I'm understanding this question. So if you're doing a public, so that you could you could get the funds right to 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 put this into in in town. Yeah. Um. I, well, first of all, if I was, I would let them know how long this is going to last. So if you get the existing technology, this is a great investment for 20 years. Um. The other thing I would be saying is, you know, we're seeing climate change becoming increasingly more disruptive, and I don't, I never like to leave uh, people with with fearful messages because it's not it's about being just being prepared and having the technology the ability to support yourself in the advantage of a power outage so you know that that snow covered cabin that i showed you i could take the snow off and i could power my cabin i don't have any other electricity yet i have a television in there i have uh, internet i have the ability to do so many things in that little cabin because all i need is three solar cells so i think it's really important to show that you know you're in for as you're moving for the to make to create a better awareness that you can become more sustainable, but you can also support your city or town when you have other crises that you can't be prepared, you can't be, you know, prepared for in advance. So I think it's really important that people think about that and try to mitigate whatever impact they have. I think that is some very thoughtful and nuanced advice. So I appreciate that, Brian, and I, I hope our teachers do too. Uh, Mr. Hancock, I'm coming to you for one final question live with us. Uh, big thank you to all our YouTube classes, groups that couldn't make it in. Again, the YouTube link will live online forever. So you can watch Brian three weeks next Tuesday or five years down the road, whenever you want to get back uh, to this and, and have a little fun. But and I won't, and I won't have aged. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Hancock, come on in for one final question. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you, Mr. Hancock. Oh. That's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your your mic's on, but you're you know, this is half the fun of technology. Something should go wrong with you. This has never happened for you before. You've had like you're like fifty for fifty in programs. Type in the chat for us while you're doing that, and we'll take that question in just a sec. I do want to note if you want to find out more about Brian's work, he's really active on Twitter. Some really cool stuff there. You can find some websites about his work at Toronto Metropolitan University. I really encourage all our classes to check that out. Uh, if you're keen on solar technology, we actually have a program right after this, about 30 minutes after we wrap here, with uh, Stanley Enigbogu, who is joining us live from Rwanda, talking about his really cool work. So a nice double header today. And with that uh, filler of conversation, Mr. Hancock's had the chance to write this in the chat now. Are there ramifications with power companies and solar energy gaining steam? And how are the other companies feeling? So like with solar, the rise, this is a very political question. No, it's a great question. It actually is a fantastic question. So um, 10 years ago when I started this, I was I was interacting with a lot of industry folks in, the, in Toronto because Toronto for Canada is like the, the business capital. And um, really, really good mentor, but he said, to me, Brian, you don't want to be trying to pitch new solar technologies to anybody. And I was like, why? Because, you know, I'm trying to be progressive because the people who are in the electricity industry are some of the most conservative investors ever on the planet. And they'd already made their investment into energy. So they don't want to see things compete. But over the last five years and this, you know, and I, I don't like to say great things about Elon Musk because he's not a perfect human being. But when the Tesla was created, it started to change the idea of how we could have nice electric vehicles. And now we have this revolution, which is starting to emerge. Now there isn't enough electricity in these power companies to power these things. And now they're looking to dive to, to make other investments in the new technology. So now finally, we do have that opportunity to see growth. And there's not this, um, this head on collision between old and new there's actually they're looking for new so that they can supplant their existing technologies because we just don't have enough electricity right now i really hope in future sort of environment versus corporate where it doesn't need to be the case that people draw a lesson from solar energy and, and wind energy in general because it seems to me that these companies that have been producing energy for so long could have, would have been the perfect adopters people to invest in this technology to advance them yeah. as opposed to being you know sort of characterized as the bad guy from the get-go where they're now you have the people with all the money that are against innovation for decades on end. So I'm glad we started coming away from that, but it's a really interesting sort of history of science and history of technology story. Yeah, and history history of, of industry, right? Like I think uh, corporations have changed a lot and they've got a lot better in supporting sustainability, um, but there's a long way to go, right? Because profits don't always square with sustainable things, yeah. but they should. If they look at the, the long-term costs and they're seeing it now, right? Like. If you have a hydroelectric dam that and you have a flood, well, if that dam breaks because you have too much water pushing on it or something happens, you know, that could be a problem for them. So I think they're starting to realize that climate change 
is real and that it's a threat. And if they don't diversify their 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 technologies, then there's going to be a bigger problem. My favorite fiction book ever. This is, might be beyond some of our students today, but for the older high schoolers in the audience, anyone who's watching as an adult, uh, The Ministry for the Future, Kim Stanley Robinson, this beautiful book, sort of a, a theoretical, hypothetical future starting right now and how things would progress in that politics, in the industry, in the world, on how to sort of revalue how we grow as a society. And it was a just a genius, genius book uh, that I read over the winter. So I, I encourage people to check that out as well. Brian, we are at the end of our broadcast. As I said, time flies and you're having fun. Thank you so much for joining today. I hope people take the opportunity to learn more about all of these topics, about your work particularly. Um, a big thank you to our YouTube groups. And as we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in Mr. Hancock's class to say a thank you and farewell as well. Um, really appreciate you joining us today, Brian. <laughs> thank you. Fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Bye, Mr. Hancock. Bye, students in the background over the, the other way. <laughs> See you later, guys. Thanks.